Hi everybody, it's Katina and I am here today to talk to you about bass clarinet. So I put up a call for questions up in the chat bar, so if you have any questions go ahead and put them up there, I'll be looking at those. But since we're starting here with another bass clarinet basics live stream, I wanted to talk to you today about embouchure. So bass clarinet embouchure is a little bit different than B-flat clarinet embouchure. We tend to have a much tighter B-flat clarinet embouchure. So for those of you that don't know, you want these corners nice and firm, so you're pulling this chin down to a point like you have an evil goatee or a witch's chin. And then you can have a little bit of squishiness there, but really the power is in the corner right here. And I'm not one of those people that do um, that plays with double lip, so I do not curl my top lip under my top teeth. Some people do, and it's beautiful sound. It's really nice when they play that way, but I'm not one of them. So with bass clarinet, you still want to have these nice controlled corners right in there. But I don't have quite the... Um, this the very strict B flat embouchure. I find for me, if I do that, I have too much leaking for the bass, so I have to make that accommodation there. The big thing with bass for us really, really is air. And so with this control here, you know, I see people play and they have a little bit of a squishy chin and that's okay depending on who you are. And please forgive my cat. He is crying by the door. He is very sad to not be here for this. So the other one that you, that I need to address is the neck on the bass clarinet. So, Hey, um, I don't have my glasses on, so I'm going to put them on so I can read. Um, Oh, Christina, hi. But when I put my glasses on, then I get the reflection from the light and it drives me bananas. Um, so with bass clarinet, I have one of the necks that goes just like this. And then there's the other ones with the big dip in there. So they, the angled neck. And a lot of people play those. I know the buffet clarinets mainly came that way. This is a Selmer. I actually prefer this neck than the other one. I don't, I don't have as much control with that bass clarinet neck as this one. So Tyler's here. Hey, Tyler. So for those of you that have your bass clarinets at home, most of the school basses are like this. But I have seen the angled neck more and more frequently. So with the neck... The, I can do this with the angled neck that is more like a B flat clarinet embouchure you have a little bit since it's the same angle that it goes up to your top teeth you can keep that same embouchure in there so for bass we're going to just set your embouchure and then bring that bass to you this is the hardest part honestly when I'm teaching bass clarinet is a lot of people go to their bass and you really should bring your clarinet to you even for bass so you want to bring your clarinet to you <laughs> curve with my embouchure actually when I go up it's just a slight difference but I have to sort of press down a little bit with the sides of my lip up here to get those notes over the um so once I hit F natural here the G I have to voice it a little bit differently this comes up a lot in my videos and it comes up a lot in clinics and a lot with teaching for some reason if you can get over the break on the bass clarinet and you get up to this F that G can cause a problem and it's 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 so much of the feel in it so I'll have people just slur from F to G till they get that voicing right <laughs> And it's a little bit more resistant, but if you overblow that bad boy, you're gonna get that big famous bass clarinet squeak in there. So that's another part where you're gonna have to do a little bit of adjustment on the bass. All right, um, uh, see, I got my hat in the way of that one. Um, just watching uh, Wicked. I have not seen um, the musical Wicked and I really want to. And I was going to go see it when I was in New York two and a half weeks ago because I thought I'd be able to get tickets to a Broadway show for a really good price because people were going to cancel because of the coronavirus and it was really stupid. And I did get tickets to Hamilton, which was amazing and it was worth it. And I don't know if it was worth it to expose myself to coronavirus, but as those of you know, tw you know, two and a half weeks ago, we didn't think it was as bad as it is now. And obviously it's bad. Our Virginia governor just shut down everything. So we are not allowed to leave the house unless it's for essential travel, like to the grocery store or the doctor's office. And you can go to your job if you still need to, but that's it. 
I just moved it away, but we just got a public safety alert on my phone about that, that we're not allowed to leave the house anymore. So I hope you guys are safe and I hope you have your instruments with you and that you can practice. Um, you have enough reads because I know D'Addario had to shut their factory down and our, all their employees are in furlough. So, um, I have, I have some reads, so I'm good. But, um, one of the things that I shared it in the community section, I was interviewed for, um, this write up for the clarinet academy that I do that's still on. So as of now, we're still doing it, but I, I don't have high hopes that we're going to do an in-person one. If we do a virtual one, then maybe you guys can come. But anyway, so they interviewed me for it and they said, what, what do you want to tell people to be productive at this time? You know, what, what do you want to tell students to, to so that they stay productive? And I, I wrote back and I was like, can we change that, that question and just be like, um, what do I want to tell people so that they um, don't have nervous breakdowns? <laughs> but actually can care for themselves and one of the things that we are blessed with is being musicians so we can play music and play songs that bring us happiness and peace and we can share that with other people on social media but all right so let me see if I've got some questions here to take um yeah Oh, yeah, it sucks about the tickets. I know. Well, I actually didn't go to get the Wicked tickets because I left New York. I started to get scared. I was like, oh, maybe I should go now. Um, uh, oh, chip most of your B-flat reads. Oh, no. Hopefully you have three that will last you. Oh, my gosh. I don't even know where to start with that. I mean, maybe you can try and get some reads shipped to you. Um, you can check Music and Arts, Amazon. Uh, Van Doren might still have some in their factory warehouse. Um, but it's whether or not they have employees to ship that stuff. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Um, that's awful. Um, so hopefully you have enough reads that you can make do. Um, and then, oh yeah, so, oof, the reads. I wish there was something I could do to help. I'm gonna brainstorm that one. All right, so back to bass clarinet embouchure. It's just a little bit, it's just a little bit different than B flat. Um, and I am one of these people that has the straight neck, so I have a little bit more looser there. When you go up into the altissimo range, that also takes a little tiny bit of adjustment. I find that I just push my jaw a little bit forward. So this is all experiment on your own playing, your own mouthpiece, your own mouth, your own read, because all of us are different. And so my suggestion is to be able to play up higher to start here on F, once you can play over the break, and then just sort of slur into the G, and then F, G, G sharp, F, G, G sharp, A, and just kind of slur your way up into that C. Also, that E position that we use for B flat clarinet, you're gonna want that here too. But I modify that one too by kind of more like that with sort of flattening out the front of my tongue which works for that. And then the last thing that I want to talk to you about, because if we're going to talk about embouchure, and I'll talk about this with every bass clarinet video, and I should do with every B flat one is air, especially as you go down low. Like I really feel it in my abdominal muscles there. I just sort of push that air out. So we need a lot of air, but that's also that balance with having a reed that's not too hard for us. So this is also very, very personal. I've met bass clarinets that play on the same strength that they play on for B flat. I play a whole strength down, not even a half strength. So I play four on my B flat and I play three on my bass and that works well for me. Now two and a half is far too light, but three and a half is a little too hard. So I have trouble getting that big sound that I like on bass, but I still can play up into the upper range in the altissimo on a three. So that's why a three works for me. I'm actually on the same strength read as most of my students when I play bass. Um, but like I said, everybody's different. The other thing I just want you to check when you're playing bass is your mouthpiece. It's just like a B flat clarinet. You want to have a good mouthpiece. You could have the finest bass clarinet in the world. And if you have a terrible mouthpiece, it's, that's where it all starts. So everything's going to sound bad right from the beginning and you can have kind of a crappy bass clarinet but if you have a wonderful mouthpiece you're going to sound good and it's easier to play and that's one of the other things that's sort of a bummer for me when i'm working with people is that a lot of times people think it's them they're like oh i'm terrible at the clarinet i'm really bad at it and then i check their mouthpiece i'm like oh it's not you it's the mouthpiece or worse yet it's these some of these bass clarinets that come out of schools are in terrible shape because they're in those big cases those old cases and they rattle around in there and i know you've seen this person where they kind of just toss the base into the case like that so they're not treated really fairly and the other one that I see that drives me bananas so 
I don't want to hit my read on the lamp or the wall, but you know our pegs right here? Please, 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 please adjust the little screw before you adjust your peg. So loosen that screw, adjust the peg, and then tighten the screw up. How many times, I can't tell you, I wish I had a dollar for every time I go to school and I see somebody slam their base down on the, on the ground to get that peg to move. And that's why they all get loose and then you don't have a peg that works on your base anymore. All right, another question came in. So not related to this stream, but oh, thank you for the recommendation of looking for Jason Alder. He gave me really solid advice. Isn't he amazing? Did you talk to him in person or did you watch one of his videos? He's a really great bass clarinet player, fantastic contemporary artist, and also just a really, really nice person. So if you talk to him again, please tell him I say hi, but he's, he's really a wonderful resource and he's very generous with his advice and his time. He's given me wonderful advice too. Um, so I'm glad that it worked out. He's a really great guy. Um, and Tyler, since you don't have a bass clarinet, I like to improvise by pulling the joints of my clarinet as far apart as possible and then playing it because it will sound lower. Um, I have actually thought about that in cases of great desperation when I didn't have an A clarinet with me. I'm like, maybe I can just pull everything out and I can just sort of fake it on an A clarinet and it doesn't really work that way. It's more like a quarter tone, but I'm gonna grab my B flat for a second and I should just do this as a video. Have you done this thing where um, you take your, uh, your B flat and you take your mouthpiece here. So you take your bottom joint, right? Put your bell on. Let me grab a reed. All right, I'm a nerd, so I'm still lining it up and I don't even need to line it up for this. And then you take your, then you go ahead and just put your mouthpiece here. So you have this thing. And then put your uh, reed in there and then it sounds amazing. Yes, it's very fun. And um, so there's our half clarinet. Um, and since, <laughs> I don't know, maybe you guys can give me some advice. Is it totally tone deaf to make one of those videos on how to make a clarinet carrot right now? Uh, are we are we hoarding carrots yet for food? Would it be bad if I'm like, hey, take this carrot and make a clarinet out of it? Um, okay, let me see some more questions that I have. All right, I contacted him through Instagram and I've talked to him for the past two days. Oh, good. Yeah, he's really wonderful and he's really responsive, so he's great. So I'm really glad that it worked out. Um, I know it's I, we're all nerds. April Fool's Day is coming up, so maybe we can do something with it there. Oh, we should do like a whole clarinet. You know, when you do the the four parts or duets or something like that. Um, so, all right, any other bass clarinet questions that you guys have? How many of you are bass clarinet players here, actually? So if you play bass, go ahead and write bass um, in the questions there. But, um, so yeah, the bass embouchure, just a little bit different. Um, everybody's personal, so if you, you know, you have to change things to get it to work, definitely do it. Um, I, and if you don't have your instrument, I'm sad for you, but if you have your instrument at home, it's really, really fun to play bass. Um, is the B50 mouthpiece on bass? Okay, B50, B50. Is that a Van Doren mouthpiece? Um, I have a Selmer C Star, which I love, and it was refaced by Matheson, so um, I had it professionally refaced on the inside, which I really, really like, and I've been playing this one for a long time. Um, it, my thing with bass clarinet mouthpieces is that if it works for you and you are able to play the high range up into the altissimo and you're able to play low into the low and it feels good and you're able to, to do that and it's in tune, and your reads work. And that's one of the things that was hard work, hard won knowledge for me is I had a mouthpiece once that I really loved because everybody was like, oh, you're gonna love this mouthpiece. So there was that little bit of that peer pressure because everybody else was using it and they said that I should use it. And it had a beautiful sound, but every time I articulated on it, there'd be a little chirp in there somewhere. So that it would be a little squeaky. And then I could never get a read that I liked. So the reads were always kind of a little bit fuzzy and stuffy always, every single one. And that was when I realized, you know, if every read is like this, even reads that work on my other mouthpiece, cause I would take my old mouthpiece out and try my read on it. I thought, you know what, this is probably a mouthpiece situation. So as much as I love that mouthpiece, I, I put it away and then I went back to my other one. So my advice for mouthpieces, everybody, we're all different. Um, everybody's um, oral cavity is different. Everybody's style of playing is different. Um, so 
if it works for you, if it's in tune, your reads are good, you know, as reads go, you're not getting chirpy articulations, you're able to articulate the way you want to. So you're able to do the different kinds of articulations that you want to, you're able to articulate as quickly as you want to. And the sound is what you like, then it's a good mouthpiece. The other piece of advice I have for picking out a, a mouthpiece is to go with somebody else that can listen. Ideally, your clarinet teacher, or your band director, or somebody that's a, another clarinetist. You can go down the hierarchy of needs. So I would do clarinet teacher first, band director second, um, another clarinetist third, and then another musician fourth, and then maybe somebody that's not a musician if you can't get anybody. But definitely play it for somebody so that they can hear it too, because we can never hear it the way other people hear it. So that was a good one about the mouthpiece. Um, contrabass, sorry, and I love the contrabass. Do you have your contra with you? Because if you do, that's absolutely amazing. That's incredible. Um, yes, yeah, so a bass clarinet player. Um, yeah, bass, um, contrabass, have you played, um, oh shoot, there's so many good band pieces for bass, um, and I'm blanking on my, my first bass clarinet, so when I was, um, when I first um, started doing the all-state band and thing competitions like that, I, I was doing it on contra alto and contra bass, and um, incantation and dance, we played that at, we in Pennsylvania had districts and regional band, and I believe it was district band, yeah, district, region, state, and I think it was district band that we played incantation and dance, and it was so much fun to play that in contra. It was incredible, yeah. It's actually a good part, not like, you know, for those of you out there that don't know, we tend to read a lot of tuba parts, so that one was a good one. Um, so thank you guys for coming. Um, as always, you can reach out to me with questions. Sometimes I can't get to them, but I try to. Um, and, uh, I appreciate all of you so much being a part of my YouTube channel and watching my videos. I consider, I said it to um, somebody on Facebook because there's this thing, uh, sub for sub thing going around and, and somebody said, wow, you, you have a nice amount of followers and I do. And I said, but they're all really wonderful people. One of the things I was nervous about was doing a YouTube channel and having people be mean in the comments, but all you guys have always been really nice and really appreciative and very good with your constructive critic, constructive feedback that I get. So I just wanted to thank you all so much because I wouldn't be here without you. You guys make me want to keep making the videos. So I really appreciate it. All right, thanks for watching. I have to go take care of this cat situation. Bye.